We see this as a public health crisis, and we intend to be a catalyst of change and to address this, and we think uh, that you are the right partners for that. Schools are ground zero of the epidemic, and if we want to move policy forward, we need to educate the public what's really going on. It's more of incumbent upon us to find a solution to try because it's happening more in our schools hmm. than it is outside our schools. We have a responsibility to protect vulnerable youth from being misled, and so we have got to have a campaign that say this will kill you, this is going to damage your health. Whatever has been coming out in the media so far really hasn't made a difference in changing the kids' attitudes. We're seeing a rise the last three years. I could go to any one of our eight high schools that are about 2,000 students each and ask the principal to open up a drawer and you will see thousands of vape cartridges. These numbers are probably underreported. These percentages are actually a lot lower than what actually is going on. They're probably lying about it because, you know, they don't want to get caught. They don't want their parents to find out. They're hiding it from people. But I also think that they know that it's bad. But they're addicted to this point where it's like, OK, I can't stop. I think our students are responding to the pressure cooker that we ourselves have inadvertently created. I mean, the competitive environment among these kids, my kids were pretty good students, and I had no idea just the pressure that they were under. Ultimately, you're trying to figure out what works. Yeah. You know, we're trying to kind of help the kids that already are addicted, but we're also trying to bring awareness to how serious this is. It is a twofold approach, you know, I mean, preventative side on one side, but there, there has to be that consequence on the other, especially when they're using things that are in violation of the law. We're moving in a direction where we've actually developed modules now and we're putting kids on a restorative path, meaning there's a diversion program. Instead of putting cameras in bathrooms to catch kids, they're actually building posters and education tools. I think the number one resource to assist us along this will be our students because they're going to want, uh, they want the relief as bad if not more so. Everyone's doing it and that's where it becomes a problem is because everyone says my friends are doing it, they're fine, they're here today and they don't have any problems yeah. so it's okay if I do it. When they survey youth around why they're you know, using e-cigarettes and it comes back to well my friends are doing it, if there's a lot of peer interaction, friends are critically important and so peer is going to be the key to reversing it and then that educational piece so that they really do understand the truth. Somehow or another we have a collectively have to make sure that this gets on the radar of every superintendent in this country to make sure that we're dealing with this. There's a call for action for us all to work together, engaging youth influencers, educators, parents, and informing youth and engaging youth themselves. Don't let the conversation end today, okay? Take it forward and let's do something about it. Okay, use the weight and the gravity of your signature, your position, and who you are within your communities to truly take this conversation forward and make an impact. On behalf of the American Heart Association, I want to thank you all for joining us for our virtual discussion on the vaping epidemic and making the case in achieving tobacco-free school districts. I'm Wesley Franklin, Community Impact Director for the AHA and will serve as today's moderator. We will take an in-depth look at the trends in youth tobacco use, why kids are so vulnerable to addiction, share resources to help support students who need to quit, and share opportunities for district leaders to receive support in implementing a tobacco-free school framework. So now I would like to introduce you to my esteemed panel of experts. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Jeff Willett. Jeff is the Vice President with the American Heart Association, where he leads the AHA's tobacco in-game strategy designed to eliminate the tremendous health impact caused by tobacco use and vaping. Jeff has, Jeff has an extensive background directing and evaluating comprehensive tobacco prevention and control programs, including serving as a research scientist with the New York State Department of Health and as a Vice President with the Truth Initiative, a Washington, D.C., Based foundation focused on preventing and reducing youth tobacco use. A native of Nebraska, uh, Jeff got his start in tobacco control working on a team that was evaluating the impact of tobacco-free Nebraska program. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Amy Kimball. Uh, Dr. Kimball is a practicing pediatrician at Health Trust Physicians Clinic in Madison County Healthcare System in Winterset, Iowa. She was the immediate past president of the Iowa chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and served as a co-chair of the Legislative Committee and as a member of the Mental Health and Pediatric Obesity Committees. She currently serves as the e-cigarette chapter champion 
for the Iowa chapter of the AAP. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, for being here. And next, Nathan Ware, who serves as the Associate Superintendent at, at Lindmark Community School District. Ware comes from Solon Community School District, where he was the high school principal since August of 2011. Prior to Solon, he was the elementary principal at Fairfield Community School District for six years. In 2002, he earned a bachelor's degree from, at Wartburg College in elementary, elementary education and earned a Master of Arts degree in Education Administration from Texas State University in 2005. In addition, he holds a, an Advanced Study Certificate and Superintendency from the University of Northern Iowa in 2011. And lastly, Matt Mendering, a dear friend, principal at Dowling Catholic High School. Matt has worked in the field of education for, the, for 30 years, spent the first 16 years of his career at Sheldon High School, eight years as a business teacher, eight years as principal, and 11 years as the head football coach. He then transitioned to his current role as principal at Dowling Catholic High School, where he has worked for the past 11 years. Matt graduated from Sheldon High School, Buena Vista College with a bachelor's degree, and Drake University with a master's degree. He has also served on the Greater Des Moines Board of Directors for the American Heart Association. Thank you all for being here today and to share your message an insight on this growing concern that is affecting our youth. For our guests listening in, please use the chat box feature to send your questions uh, as we will monitor those questions and we'll share with our panelists towards the end. To let us know that you are here, we would like to know which community school dist districts are being represented here today. So go ahead and please place that information uh, in that chat box now. So to help us get started, I would like to turn to Dr. Jeff Willett to share with us about the growing trends and emerging threats in youth tobacco use. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, again, I'm Jeff Willett with the American Heart Association uh, and I'm gonna to talk to you about trends and emerging threats in, in youth tobacco use. So first, it's important to recognize how much progress we've made in reducing youth cigarette smoking in the United States. Uh, if we go back to 1997, you know, the peak of the Joe Camel era, one in four high school students in the United States smoked uh, cigarettes. And together, we all worked very hard for over two decades. And in 2020, only one in 20 high school students smoked cigarettes. Uh, that's a tremendous public health achievement, you know, going from one in four to one in 20. Uh, but it also took a tremendous amount of work. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen a tremendous increase in youth tobacco use recently through the form of e-cigarettes. And in 2020, one in five high school students uh, in the United States used e-cigarettes. Uh, Wes, if we could go to the next uh, slide um, and, uh, and then go ahead and, and go to the next slide. Uh, so a primary reason why young people start using e-cigarettes and continue using e-cigarettes is the tremendous appeal of flavored e-liquids. Uh, youth appealing flavors dominate the marketplace, and we know the vast majority of young people who first try an e-cigarette, first try with a flavored product, and we know the vast majority of young people who continue to use e-cigarettes uh, are using flavored e-liquids. So removing these youth appealing flavored products from the market is critical to public health. Uh, next slide. When we think about the recent history with e-cigarettes, we can better understand how, as a society, uh, vaping became such a major issue for youth. In 2013, the major tobacco companies introduced their versions of the electronic cigarette, and they did so in largely an unregulated environment. The FDA did not have the authority at the time to regulate e-cigarettes, and many of our states and communities didn't regulate the sale of e-cigarettes. Uh, in 2015, Juul was introduced and Juul has a very sleek, sophisticated design. It looks like a USB drive. It can be used very discreetly. Uh, Juul was 
sold uh, in a wide range of youth appealing flavors, and the Juul liquids had a very high nicotine content. And it was really in 2015 that we started to see a tremendous acceleration in youth e-cigarette use. In 2016, the FDA was finally uh, granted the authority to regulate e-cigarettes, but it's still taking them time to regulate uh, them in a way that really protects kids. Uh, in 2019, we saw the outbreak of Evoli, a serious lung injury that was associated with vaping. And I think Evoli and the concern around vaping-related injuries certainly contributed to increased awareness of the potential harms of e-cigarettes and also contributed to some reduction that we've seen recently in e-cigarette use. And then in 2020, uh, last year, a couple major policy changes occurred. Uh, first, the age to purchase tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, was increased to 21 at the federal level. And second, the FDA acted to remove certain flavored e-liquids from the market. Uh, so if you had a product that sold e-liquids in a, in a pod or a cartridge system like a Juul, those products could no longer contain uh, the youth appealing flavored liquids other than menthol. But if it was a, a disposable system, you know, a one-time use disposable system or a refillable tank system you know, that you poured liquid in, those were exempt from the federal regulation. So today we continue to see disposables and refillable systems selling those flavored e-liquids. Uh, next slide. The fight against uh, big tobacco is constantly changing. We have to be vigilant with the new products the industry is introducing, and we need to address loopholes that big tobacco successfully exploits to continue selling their products and addicting new generations. Uh, today, we are, uh, we're very concerned about flavored tobacco. You know, we're really concerned about menthol cigarettes. Half of all students who smoke traditional cigarettes use menthol flavored cigarettes. And we're really concerned about the youth appealing flavors that are still available in disposable systems like Puff Bar and refillable systems like Soren. Uh, so the next slide, uh, again, the tobacco companies look for any loopholes in regulation. Uh, Puff Bar is a disposable e-cigarette that looks almost exactly like a Juul, uh, but it's designed for one-time use. Well, recently Puff Bar announced that it is now using synthetic nicotine. And so it believes that its products should be exempt from federal, state, and local laws regarding e-cigarettes and other tobacco products. So we have to be uh, constantly vigilant. We have to constantly monitor what the industry is doing. And we have to ensure that we have the policy protections in place, especially for young people who should not be using these products under any circumstances. Uh, so with recent trends in youth tobacco use, we have seen a reduction between 2019 and 2020 with regard to the overall use of tobacco products among high school and middle school students, reductions in the use of e-cigarettes among both high school and middle school students, and a reduction in the use of uh, combustible products like cigarettes and cigars but we're still at a point where far too many young people are using tobacco product, products. Uh, again, one out of every five high school students is using e-cigarettes. Uh, the reductions that we saw between 2019 and 2020 are likely the result of volley, the serious lung injury, and likely related to the policy actions, you know, to increase the age to purchase products and uh, the removal of some flavored e-liquids from the market. Uh, what we don't know at this point is how exactly COVID has further impacted youth vaping. And we don't know what uh, impact a return to you know, full-time in-person learning across the United States will have on social pressures and access to uh, e-cigarettes. So just to summarize what we're seeing with teens and vaping, e-cigarettes are the most commonly used tobacco product among youth. Uh, 3.6 million young people across the United States are using e-cigarettes, and fruit, mint, and menthol are the top flavors that we see young people use in terms of vaping. So again, those youth-appealing flavors, even though there's been some action to remove them from the market, 
youth are still primarily using those flavored e-liquids. And disposable e-cigarettes are emerging as a primary threat. We saw a 1,000% increase in the use of disposable e-cigarettes by high school students and a 500% increase among middle school students in the past year. So Puff Bar and similar disposable systems are working to gain market share. Uh, again, they're, they're doing so in a way that kind of takes advantage of a loophole in federal regulation, and we need to ensure that that does not happen. Uh, so next slide, uh, thanks Wes. Uh, you know, uh, last week, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, please go back if you can to the previous slide. Um, uh, last week, the FDA made a very exciting announcement regarding menthol. Uh, it announced that it was going to work toward a rulemaking that would ban the sale of menthol cigarettes and all flavored cigars. Uh, if this happens, it would be a tremendous public health victory that would protect kids. Uh, again, half of all teens who smoke uh, cigarettes use menthol flavored uh, cigarettes. And we know that flavored cigars in general are also popular among uh, young people. Uh, but the action the FDA announced would not address the fact that the FDA continues to allow the sale of menthol flavored e-liquids. Uh, you know, you can go to the Juul website and order menthol flavored uh, pods uh, today and also does not address the loophole that I mentioned earlier regarding uh, the disposable and refillable systems. Uh, and it's not just e-cigarettes that are the problem. New forms of tobacco like Zin, which is an oral uh, nicotine pouch, and Icos, which is a heated tobacco product, have been introduced in the US. Uh, Zin is sold in a wide range of flavors. So we're keeping our eye on these products and we want to ensure that all tobacco products are regulated in a way that is protecting kids first and foremost. At the American Heart Association, we're working at the federal, state, and local level to ensure that all tobacco products, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and other forms of tobacco are not addicting the next generation. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Jeff, for sharing your message. And it's quite concerning as the, there's more products that are gonna be becoming more available. Uh, as we move forward with it. So we need to definitely stay ahead of the game with this. So, so thank you very much, Jeff. Next, we're gonna share Claire's story and her journey as a student with vaping. I'm Claire, um, I'm 16, I'm a junior. Well, I started vaping when I was probably in eighth or ninth grade. Um, it started through sports, honestly, just people on my team like that was who I was with most of my time. I, I didn't like it at first, it hurt, I coughed. It was like, I was like, this is icky. I think we need to deal with mental health and the reason why people are using. Personally for me, vaping was a way to have something else like use to cope with my mental health, to cope with my depression, to cope with my anxiety. I would go through three pods a day, which would be like my pods held, held about like two milliliters. And so two milliliters of juice, if you like look it up, is equivalent to like a pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine. And so technically I was inhaling three packs worth of nicotine. I got so scared, but I was too scared to tell anyone that this was happening to me because I knew I was going to get in trouble. I hated it. And yet the addiction was so strong that I kept using. And my parents... They did not have the reaction I thought. My mom was like, like she sat me down and I talked to my mom and my dad for like a solid like two hours. Life is not easy, like school's not easy, friendships are not easy, but you need to make it through this hard point in your life so that you can have your future and addictive chemicals aren't gonna help you get there. It's not gonna get you to where you wanna be. Very powerful message from a young lady there to share her story with it. Next, we'll have Dr. Amy Kimball to share her message around this growing concern and providing more of a clinical perspective. Uh, I'm very thankful to have her on this panel as well. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Wesley, for having me. Um, as mentioned, I'm a pediatrician in Winterset, Iowa. Um, I'm also a mom, though, a mom of a graduating senior and a mom of a soon-to-be freshman. So having vape free schools and tobacco-free schools is not only professionally very important to me, but also personally very important to me. And I, as mentioned, I do want to spend a little time talking more about the clinical um, picture of this and some of the heart health related effects uh, related to this and present you some resources that we can use for parents and for families. And Jeff really previewed a lot of this and so um, I can kind of build off of what he mentioned, but We've seen many generations of the development of e-cigarettes and going from the initial cigalike um, formation in 2007 to what's most popularly used, the mods and the pod-based systems right now. Um, and we really see that um, these have just been really marketed um, towards youth. Um, they were originally, it was brought up of a way to um, look at tobacco cessation. And we just really are not finding that we see this as a very effective cessation product, um, especially with the higher nicotine levels. Um, majority of adults are not using these for cessation. It's more of a transfer of use, um, and the youth are definitely becoming more addicted to them. Um, we know that e-cigarettes are the most commonly used form of tobacco for youth, and again, it, as Jeff mentioned, it's just skyrocketing in our use. In 2018, we were at 21% of high school students using this and 5% of middle school students. Um, and that was 1.5 million youth. Uh, that's a lot of young people in just a year time. Um, and we know that youth who use e-cigarettes are much more likely to progress on to using other traditional cigarettes. And the pandemic has brought up some, some increasing concerns, not only with youth sharing, uh, which they frequently do share their jewels and share their pod based systems. So you have concern for infection issues there, but also we know that people and especially young people who are using e-cigarettes are five times more likely to have severe effects if they do have COVID um, and have secondary illness from that. And if they are both using e-cigarettes and traditional tobacco um, cigarettes, cigarettes or combustible cigarettes, then they are seven times more likely to have complications from COVID. Um, we did see some reduction because of the pandemic because they couldn't share, but um, we're seeing an increase again, uh, sadly. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so Juul and e-cigarettes, as mentioned, have really increasing amounts of nicotine available to where they are pretty much double what the original e-cigarettes had in them. And as we see those increasing uh, levels of nicotine, uh, we see increased addiction potential for our youth. Um, and as was mentioned in Claire's story, you know, one pod is equivalent to a pack or 20 cigarettes. And um, many youth, when we interview them, are going through multiple pods a day as they become more infected. Um, addicted to this. So their nicotine concentrations are just astronomical at this time. We know that um, youth that use and become addicted to nicotine, not only do we worry about their secondary use of combustible cigarettes, but also other drug use as they go through. Um, and they're more likely to become smokers if they've started with e-cigarettes. And this is included for children who, if you take a young person who was not really at risk of becoming a traditional combustible cigarette user, if they've used e-cigarettes, then they are suddenly just as at much risk. So it really becomes almost a gateway product for them. Next slide, please. We're also seeing, um, we've seen that intensity increase. So um, the 11th graders went from 9.1% in 2016 to again, 22.4% uh, in 2018. And the youth vaping rate has surpassed both youth alcohol uh, use and other drug use during that time. And this just really is the first thing that they are grabbing for. So about 80% of 11th graders who tried e-cigarettes, that was really their first new thing that they tried and um, first, you know, risky behavior that they got into. And we know that tobacco kills greater than 480,000 people a year and um, costs over a billion dollars in healthcare costs. And what our concern is, is what this is going to do with our long, long term products or problems from youth utilizing these materials. 
So the U.S. Uh, national rates, this is the 2020 data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey. Um, and again, as Jeff mentioned, we saw a little bit of a decline after that huge burst in 2019 uh, to where we have um, at the high school smoking rate at 4.6% and 19.6% um, nationally for e-cigarette use. Um, what we don't want to see is that um, that nice little bump down that we saw. We don't want to see that increase again. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, again, we are kind of cautiously watching that um, as things start to open up more and um, youth are more in schools together and participating in more social events. Next slide, please. So then Iowa, um, I hate to say we're not quite faring as well. We, we actually have higher levels than the national averages right now. Um, our high school students who smoke, 6.7%, and we're at 20.1% for those who are using e-cigarettes. Um, so we do still have some work to do in Iowa. Next slide, please. So in 2019, 22.7% of Iowa high school youth reported currently using any tobacco product, and that was including e-cigarettes. Um, and among high, Iowa high school youth, 6.7% uh, report that they, 6.7%, sorry, report that they are currently um, smoking cigarettes. So what are the risks really? Um, we, we hear a lot about the addiction potential of the e-cigarettes and the effects on the brain. And we, we hear a lot in, um, about you know, the e-volley and the risks on the lungs from direct injury, just from the inhalation, and then some of the chemicals and changes with that. But you know, the e-cigarettes the e and these products really affect the entire body and they definitely have cardiovascular effects. Um, we know that there are effects on the blood vessels it affects their ability to relax and to stretch out and dilate, um, and that leads to long-term cardiovascular disease. Um, just like traditional combustible cigarettes, um, e-cigarettes do produce free radicals when they are inhaled, and those free radicals make changes in our, in our cells, and those then also lead to long-term cardiovascular disease. So nicotine, we know it affects the brain. We know it's an addictive um, product, but it also has other secondary effects just on other parts of the body. Um, nicotine increases the heart rate and it creates that fight or flight mechanism um, in people when they utilize that. And so when you look at these high levels of nicotine in these pods and mod based systems, you've got a huge rush of adrenaline, a huge rush of that fight or flight mechanism. So you add that to the complication of a young person who is likely drinking a highly caffeinated drink at the same time that they are using their, their jewel. Um, or doing a uh, energy drink with increased rates of sugar and caffeine. And all of those things are going to increase that heart rate further. And if they're in fear of potentially getting caught, you've also got that fight or flight mechanism. So all of those things combined are putting added stressors on the heart. Nicotine also causes increased risk with the lungs um, and just the products that you're breathing in, then that can cause some secondary and we really don't know 100% what the long-term product and, and problems are with this because we haven't had these around long enough to be able to uh, foreshadow 100% where, where these young people are going to be in 10 and 20 years, and especially those who have had anything with Evoli. But we know what the chemicals do. We know what the byproducts are, and we know those harms. So when we take that science, we, we know that these are harmful um, and doing more and more to try to educate these young people and then continuing to study. And as we learn that, explaining to them, you know, what these byproducts are and, and what this is causing for their system. We know that those aerosols produced um, have enter their lungs and cause irritation, um, like Claire mentioned, causing the coughing right away, but they will continue to work right through that. Um, the nicotine is addictive, and our biggest concern is that we know that we're creating a whole new generation of addicted young people. Jeff mentioned the flavors, um, and these were definitely marketed at youth, um, and they're, they're very appealing to youth. Um, and thankfully, we had some reduction and some improvement um, with some of the federal changes, but 
there's again there's ways around this and uh, they are still getting a hold of these different flavors especially with the new puff bars and um, and these are very appealing to them we also know that some of these flavors themselves cause problems so it's not just that it's getting them addicted but the flavors are also cytotoxic so cinnamon is one of the main ones that is really causing issues um, and then some of the cherry flavors um, these are actually chemicals that are toxic to our cells and are carcinogenic so um, just the flavor alone causes a problem and that's with before you throw the nicotine and everything else with it so again, as Jeff mentioned, we did see some progress. Um, you know, if we could end the sale of all flavored tobacco products, um, that would be outstanding. It would help to um, minimize some of this epidemic. Um, and everything needs to be all inclusive. So if we're including menthol flavors, we need to make sure that it's including menthol flavored e-cigarettes and all access points for that. Um, the legislation that was passed by the House in February of 2020 um, looked at um, eliminating all of these flavors. And so every step forward is progress, but we just need to make sure that that continues. And definitely the um, insight from the FDA that they're going to be looking at the menthol, um, we would definitely stress that that also include any of the e-cigarettes, not just the traditional cigarettes, because we know those menthol flavors are very, very appealing to our youth and also to our minorities that are um, at our highest risk of becoming addicted. And the flavors, as you get these flavors on board, it allows people to take in higher levels of nicotine because you don't get that harsh flavor um, with the um, with the nicotine like you would in a traditional cigarette. And there was just the mention of the, um, if you could go back one, sorry, Wesley, the, the flavorings in the cardiovascular disease, I think we're learning more. So, um, you know, we know about some of the other cell issues, but um, this um, Stanford Cardiovascular Institute report um, really showed that just the flavorings with varying levels of nicotine altered what the cells could do. So again, the flavorings alone are harmful, and then you add them to the known toxicities of the nicotine. And next slide, thank you. So what can we do to, re to help our families and help our um, parents? Um, the Iowa Department of Public Health does have access points um, and some really good resources on their vaping support page. And um, as listed on my slide here, all of those are actually from their site. And so you can go on those and there's resources for the parents, there's resources for youth and so on. Um, the My Life, My Quit is a youth um, directed program. Um, so kind of like the Quit Line Iowa for adults, this is directed for 13 to 17 year olds and really helps them to um, kind of develop their own program with a, a real life coach um, to work on becoming um, nicotine free. And they get a certificate at the end, um, which they really enjoy those rewards. And so that's a helpful um, part of this. And we are one of nine states um, that is partnering with the National Jewish Health Foundation to um, provide this. So we're really excited to see um, what this can provide. And, and I've had several of my patients utilize this very successfully. Um, next slide, please. Um, Become an X is another program that has been out there and traditionally been more used in the adult arena. This was developed um, in coordination with Mayo. Um, and again, it's they, they get a customized quit plan. They work on a quitting date and work with this coaching. And then as they become an X, they then wind up helping other people um, to become an X. So that's been also a very successful module. And next slide. Um, there are more... Um, teen specific ones um, that are definitely app and text based. So Smoke Free Teen um, from the National Institutes of Health. Um, this is quitting. Um, so they text Ditch Jewel uh, to 88709. And one question that always comes up for me on this one is, is this only for Jewel? It's not. We just know that the students will remember Ditch Jewel and so they remember what to text. Um, there's a separate line that they, uh, that the students um, go on and then there's a separate access point for the parents for this and this text based immediate cessation coaching um, and these are also very successful and this one is from the truth initiative and then the national tobacco quit line has 1-800 quit now um, and I will just say from a from a clinical perspective if I have a young person in my office who is interested in quitting um, we pull out their phone 
and they start this right in the office because if you can get them started, not tomorrow, um, not a week from now, let's go ahead and do it right now. The same as if I have a parent who's concerned, we can get them signed up right in the office and we find that much more successful. And next slide. One of the biggest concerns parents have is how do they even start this conversation and what do they say and how do they answer certain questions and how should they react and there's lots of good resources for this. Um, the vape talk is one that's available from the American Lung Association. That's a YouTube um, video and then there's a talk vaping with your teen um, program that's a web based um, kind of goes through different con conversation modules and um, examples of things to say and kind of how to handle different dialogue um, and definitely always having them talk with healthcare providers um, about this. And last slide, and then of course, through the American Heart Association, um, the, their modules on how to keep kids, um, teens and teens from smoking and vaping. Um, there's excellent modules on there, um, and that's another great resource that we send families to. The American Academy of Pediatrics um, parent website, healthychildren.org, also has great resources and then has links to all of these other, um, so parents can find out about the details of all of this by going to that site. We work directly as providers with the um, AAP, the Richmond Center for Excellence, um, and they are constantly updating and, and researching on information. That's a great wealth of information. And there are some exciting new um, ventures, hopefully soon in the works of, um, with the American Academy of Pediatrics working in collaboration with schools um, to help in similar projects with this um, to promote cessation um, and support. So, with that, I will turn things over to Nathan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kimball. And I tell you what, those Iowa sets are definitely staggering. And there's a lot of work that we need to do to start turning this trend around. So that being said, next, I want to turn to Nathan, our Associate Superintendent for Lindmar School, uh, Community School District. And Nathan, definitely glad to have you on this call for, here, for today and, and to learn what you guys are doing at, uh, within your school district. Yeah, thanks, Wesley, and thanks to the fellow panelists, too, for, you know, partnering with this opportunity and giving us uh, school people a chance to, to be on this call as well. So, yeah, you know, this, this is concerning to us, and when we see that data from a school perspective, it, it certainly uh, gets us to start thinking about, hey, what can we do to be a partner in this process? So, I'm really glad that the American Heart Association is, is with us on this initiative and there to provide support. So yeah, I, you know, I don't have any formal slides. I just want to tell a story and really from the superintendent's view of things, like what, what are we thinking of from a school aspect with this? And I go back to when I started as a high school principal and, and Matt will share his views from the high school currently, but I started in 2011 and at a nearby school district. And, you know, I, I thought we didn't have kids smoking and really didn't have for a couple years any issues with that. Um, and all of a sudden overnight, and that matched Jeff's statistics that he shared, you know, in 2013, we all of a sudden had kids just vaping everywhere and all the time. And how I found out about it was we had teachers that re had reported to us that somebody kept spraying perfume, a fruit flavored perfume in the hallways, and they were trying to catch who was doing it. So I finally got on our video cameras and it wasn't perfume. It was kids that had a jewel that were walking down the hallway, vaping right inside of our schools. What was surprising to me at that time is that our teaching staff and our school staff just really didn't know what those products were. And immediately for us, we knew that we needed to start updating some policies. We needed to start educating parents and really making that, them aware that this was happening. I, I think the other thing that really sticks out to me from an educator's point of view is that kids saw this as a healthy alternative, right? They would say, it's just vapor. And we know that now with the research that's coming out and what we've just seen in this uh, webinar, that that's so not true. And so, so immediately we started using our resources, whether that be uh, anything that we could do preventative in any of our school policies to start sharing the dangers. We got a lot of posters, we had signage. We talked a lot about it with our student athletes. Uh, you know, we do have kids that care about their bodies, and when they think it's just vapor and it's safe, they thought that was a safe alternative. So we immediately started trying to flip that script. Um, really what it turned down to for us was just thinking about that prevention. So we shared newsletters, we talked about that with parents, 
we try to make parents aware that, hey, this is happening. These are the things to look for. I think the other thing that's important from a school district perspective is to think about the restorative practices. And what I mean by that is we can't just get kids in trouble. Yes, they shouldn't be doing it, but handing a detention or a Saturday suspension from a school standpoint does nothing to teach that child about behavior. So as, as Dr. Kimball was talking about it, you know, that was one of the things we started to do and we changed with our behavior policies is, look, I don't, I'm not here to say this is, you know, that you're going to get in trouble. I want to talk to you about the dangers of this product. Let's make sure we get your parents involved because yes, there's a consequence, but the consequence to your health and to our community is much greater than having to serve a detention. So let's dig into that. So we really started shifting our story also to focusing on those restorative practices. Uh, the next thing that led to was policy changes because in 2013, when this really ramped up, we did not have e-cigarettes or any of that type of language in our school policy. So we started to work with our school board and get any of our policies changed that mentioned tobacco to include the language of e-cigarettes and vape and all of, the, all of the language stuff that came along with that. Part of that was then updating our good conduct policies that we had for all of our students that were involved in activities. Um, so that was, that was kind of a big undertaking because that's, that takes time, that takes time with the school boards to get those policy changes. Uh, but those were some immediate steps that we were able to do. Uh, I think the, the thing that I would pull from our student video is this idea of mental health. And so if I can impart anything on our community providers is that we are still lacking resources to help children with mental health in our, in our society and especially in our school systems. So, you know, as kids deal with the stress and anxiety that comes with them right now of being a teenager, what can we do to better help support their mental health? So that's another route that uh, as a superintendent, we have tried to think about with our kids and our educational programming. Um, we at Linmar have some specific counselors that are designated to substance abuse, mental health, um, not just our general school counselors, but counselors in addition to that. So I know that not every school district has those resources, but that's something that we're really trying to do is support kids' mental health to feel positive about themselves, and a lot of that work was happening pre-COVID. Now, we're certainly going to face a challenge when students come back on site and we get kids back in the building because we've seen increases of uh, students struggling with mental health since they've been away from our school buildings. Um, but I think that's certainly a right step that, that schools can do. Um, so not just tackling the vaping and the tobacco use, but making sure we support that with mental health. So. Those are just some things right now from a school perspective we are trying to do. We certainly value and, and really appreciate the input that our parent providers and our community providers have. So anytime that we can bring in that child's story or a parent's perspective, I know our training staff that we contract with to provide services to our student athletes talks about the dangers of nicotine and those types of things. So um, we're gonna continue down that path uh, we want to see these numbers turn around because we know that the long-term effects are, are harmful to society um, and we want to make sure our we put our kids and families in a good position. So thank you from on behalf of Limar Community School District for allowing us to share a little bit about our journey. Thank you very much, Nathan. And I'm glad that you guys are looking at that supportive approach, uh, especially tackling this issue. And I applaud you for all of the work that you have done uh, throughout your school district there. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. So next year, we're gonna play another quick video, a student impact story, and we'll hear Will's story and his journey. I'm Will. I'm a senior in high school right now, 17. I was 14 when I started vaping. I had smoked cigarettes before for a while. So when they were like, hey, it's the same thing, it's just safer, it's fine, it's like water vapor, there's less nicotine. None of those things are true. Um, so I tried it and the first thing you notice is how much smoother it feels. It doesn't feel as dangerous as a cigarette does. I think it's often overlooked how much a uh, part mental health plays in addiction. I'm 
diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and it's been a really difficult thing in my life. So when I was introduced to nicotine, it was like, hey, it's this chemical that makes you feel better. When I first started, I was a cross-country runner and cross-country skier, but um, my lung capacity was never the same. It felt like I was getting out of shape, but I knew I wasn't. That is Will's story there. So next, I would like to finally turn it to Matt Minry, principal at Dalley High School, to share his perspective on the story, a growing concern as well. Matt? Thank, thank you, Wesley, and thank you to everyone that's joining to um, have a positive impact on kids' lives moving forward. You know, I, I, I look back over my 30 years, and I, I believe um, Jeff said this earlier, but and, and Nathan corroborated that, but there's an ebb and flow of smoking over the last 30 years that I've been with high school kids. And um, if you go back, you know, the last big push of something bad for kids came out in about the mid 2000s, early 2000s, where we had um, K2, um, bath salts, um, a lot of those potpourri type things came onto the market for kids to access things. And so they weren't smoking, but they were using things, those gateway drugs to Go out and do things and um, now vaping has hit the market kind of in that same way in that same vein for kids so you know my approach is going to be talking about what what we've seen on the ground as far as with our with our kids over the two school districts that i've been in and um, you know it's it is um, something that is concerning and growing and it did it did did blow up on us and i would say here at dowling you know we've really noticed the impact about 2016 2017 and i had a call from a parent that said you had kids smoking in your classroom and i said no way this isn't happening and um because you in your mind you have this big puff of smoke right you have the cigarette coming in you have this puff of smoke and what was happening was the kids were taking the the, the jewel and they could put it right inside their watch and then they could take the puff on it and then blow it right back into their shirt in the back of class. And so you educate yourself, you find out you have a problem, and then you, you, know, you start um, moving forward quickly trying to solve that problem, or at least you know, put roadblocks in the way of, and educate people. And so as, as Nathan alluded to, you know, the first thing we had to do was educate our staff to what they had to look for. And, and, um, and then it was try to educate our students and our parents of the downsides of it. And, and you know, and, and uh, Dr. Kimball you mentioned earlier about, you know, there's no, there's no data because we're so early in this process. You know, we can scare kids with the, the pictures of chewing tobacco and, and mouth cancer. We can scare kids with all these other things, but you really can't, you can't show them hard data to say that it's bad for you. And then, you know, just the other day coming home, I'm, I'm listening to an ad from a TV or radio and they're talking about how they're marketing, you know, it's marketing these things to quit smoking. So, you know, it's, it's telling kids and it's telling parents that this is a safe alternative. It's better than smoking. And, you know, that's concerning because we know it isn't. And, and the other thing that's really impacting uh, students is we've had a couple of cases already where kids have um, thought they were smoking, you know, a Juul tobacco product and ends up being something laced with marijuana or some other type of substance. And uh, it's so easy now to disguise marijuana or the, the oil inside of these vapes that it's, it, it, it's a little bit scary because we had, you know, we've had a couple of cases where we've had some kids have some bad reactions. One here at school where the kids is up, you know, ends up in a hospital. And, and, and this story is pretty familiar around uh, talking to the other principals around the metro. You know, you have a kid that has a bad reaction. They think, it's, they think it's one thing and it's really the other. And to me, that's the scariest part of this thing is that this ends up being uh, a gateway for our students into the, the other drugs that are available. And, and right now, in, in conversations with that RSRO and other things like that, you know, it's almost easier to get marijuana than it is alcohol. And um, these kids can do this through these different, different vape um, supplies that really is probably more of the concerning piece for us as we move forward. And 
And so it's about educating parents on what to look for. And it's hard to look for because it is odorless and it may smell like something that's nice coming out of their room or in their car. You know, it's not an, it's not an air freshener. It's this or those types of things. And so here at Dowling, you know, we, we thought we did a pretty good job pre COVID of chasing it out of our building, you know, because it, you'd walk into a bathroom and you'd see, um, six kids standing around in a huddle passing a, a vape and then you know so one comes with you as they, you know and, and the rest walk away but um, we did a pretty good job pre-COVID of, of moving it out of the building and I, I think the numbers show are correct they're they're exactly in line with what we've seen to this point the scary part is, um, as COVID has worn on, our kids have become more isolated, and this is where the mental health piece comes into it. The more they've been isolated, the more we've seen, or we've seen a rise in the use again of vapes. And so um, our numbers are up, our, the amount of times that we're catching kids or we're getting wind of it or whatever um, is, has increased since we brought all the kids back into the building. And so I, I think, you know, I can't stress enough also the mental health side of it and, and helping our kids navigate through these things. They're looking for a way to um, relieve some stress, anxiety, whatever it is. And this is sold as a safe alternative. And again, it, it's a stepping stone that leads to things um, in high school that are that's going to open the door for marijuana and everything else. And that's really what we've seen the increase in is the increase of marijuana use. Um, because of that. Um, one little piece I think that parents need to know as well is look for fake IDs. Now we've been we've been seeing this with the last few instances that we have. You know, you think of fake IDs, you think of college kids, right? Well, right now our our kids for $75, you can get a and you send your picture in $75 and you're going to get a fake ID. And it's typically an out-of-state fake ID. So as a parent, you're looking for something in your child's billfold or wherever. It's usually a different name. The name has changed a little bit, but it's an out-of-state it's an out-of-state ID. And uh, they're using that. I don't think it's as easy to buy alcohol with it. And I'm just assuming right now, but I'm I think it's a little hard to buy alcohol with that fake ID if I'm 17 or 18. I think I can buy the vape. And so um, I think that's another avenue that our kids are using to create an easy access point for them to uh, acquire the vapes. And that's going to be that's something where we need to help from the parents on is to, you know, to be observant and, and to monitor the kids in that way. From a discipline side, like Nathan, too, we've had to change some policies. And if you get caught on campus here with the vape, but obviously we have an athletic part of it. It's against our codes. We also. Um, we also issue them a, a ticket because it's illegal to smoke on school grounds. So they get issued a ticket from the city of West Des Moines as well. So we give them a couple of gifts. And so it's, uh, but you know, we, we need to get their attention and you try to do it in various ways. We have students create PSAs, um, you know, public service announcements that we can run in our building with our regular announcements that we do. Um, but you got to get the kids involved and, and they're the ones that are going to help self-regulate their peers and say, knock it off because they're going to listen to them a lot quicker than they're going to listen to us. And so that's really where we need to navigate to and um, continue to educate parents on, on the, the negative side of it and what to look for. And that's the challenge really is, is how to find it and what to look for. And so I think um, as I as I wrap things up here, I think for all of us, it's 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 imperative that we continue to press on, get you know getting rid of the flavors is an outstanding thing because we know how that impacts things. But I think it's also just to keep our eye on um, cutting down those access points and it's educating. Right now, we just got to educate as many people as we can um, to the downfalls of it and uh, have a positive impact in that way. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you very much, Matt, for, for sharing your story and the things that you guys are doing at Dowling High School. And we definitely applaud your, your leadership, not only with the AHA, especially to those students there. So, so now we're gonna, I know we're coming up on time, but I wanna definitely touch on some of the components around a comprehensive tobacco-free policy, including the education, the policy, the environment, um, building that supportive approach for students 
and we'll also discuss what the AHA can do to support your school district uh, with the uh, implementation side of it. So from a holistic approach, you all are so important to this work. Uh, teachers, the schools, you know, I mean, as far as the examples that we have on this, this panel are our greatest asset uh, to our society. And the pandemic has definitely made it even clearer uh, of this concern. So schools are the front lines of the youth vaping epidemic. And faculty and staff are uniquely positioned to identify and support students who may be addicted to nic nicotine or at risk of addiction. So specifically, schools can structure their education uh, and disciplinary action to help prevent youth from starting and offer supportive approaches when students are caught using tobacco products. So the, the, the main goal here is to educate students about tobacco products uh, and the dangers of nicotine. Uh, help students remain fully engaged in their education if they are already addicted and pass comprehensive policy that supports a 100% tobacco-free environment. So let's, let's look into this a, a little bit more here. So from the education side, when we talk about education around tobacco and nicotine addiction, it is similar to any other knowledge we are hoping to pass on to our student. It needs to be consistent and, and quite frankly relevant. We suggest that students are interacting with the curriculum at least once a year and that the curriculum aligns with our state standards. Now, age appropriate and culturally relevant material is important. Uh, we know that one size fits all approach is key, but prevention is most effective if students can relate and see themselves and their experiences in the content. So it is also important to remember that there are different meanings and attitudes around tobacco and different communities should that should be considered. Uh, we have also found that the information is better retained if it is delivered in a variety of ways through classroom instruction, written materials, discussion, school-wide activities, you name it. Consider student-to-student -student and parent education strategies. Now, the staff response for teaching tobacco education should also be provided with continuous professional learning opportunities to learn how to effectively deliver the program. Now, this effort does not end with the students. Tobacco education should include everyone that is interacting in the school environment with the students, staff, parents, and visitors. Now, the AHA has a range of resources for different audiences, audiences to help communicate accurate information about tobacco and vaping and offer strategies to help any tobacco users quit for good. We know students are not the only ones using tobacco to help staff walk the walk Tobacco education and cessation services should be offered for staff as well. And this is about keeping everyone healthy and that includes the adults as well. And the final point on the education, we, we need to be careful to not accept curriculum developed or funded by tobacco industry. It is unfortunate, it is out there as well. So youth are crucial to the tobacco industry. They need, they need replacing smokers and we need to be aware of that. So from, the, from a policy standpoint, when implementing this policy, it is important that all products are covered. That is the obvious products like the cigarettes or chewing tobacco, cigars, you name it. This also includes e-cigarettes, lighters, rolling papers, and any electronic smoking device, whether or not it con contains nicotine. Uh, I know many schools have tobacco-free policies, but we want to assist in strengthening those to make sure all products are captured. Now, as you heard from Jeff and from our panel, e-cigarettes are the products most appealing to youth, contributing uh, to increasing in this use. So looking at other uh, policy essentials, so what else is in a strong tobacco-free policy? Well, it pertains to any person on school grounds, including staff and visitors. It prohibits the possession by students. It applies at all times before, during, and after school hours, weekends, field trips, and in vehicles on school property uh, needs to be included. And last, the policy would provide a progressive supportive approach to discipline when students are in violation uh, of the policy. So that supportive disciplinary approach for students and talking about tobacco policy, it is important to have a supportive approach so in a school relying on traditional discipline, the biggest issue is that a student broke the rule. In a school using supportive discipline, the biggest issue is tobacco use and bringing it to school impacts their health, 
as we mentioned on this call, has the potential to create harm for other students uh, as well. So include supportive strategies such as parental uh, slash caregiver notif notification, collaborative conversation between a student and a staff member, and offering information to the student about available tobacco education, cessation, and facility enrollment if the student is interested. Disciplinary meetings between the student, a parent or caregiver, and designated staff, and enrollment in alternatives to suspension programs. So what this should not include is you know, suspension and expulsion unless they are the last resort. Uh, do not take away those extracurricular or impose fines. We want students to stay engaged in their education and fines can be prohibited for families and, and quite frankly, can create hardships. Uh, but do not involve school resource officers or law enforcement in discipline procedures. So when it comes to the suspension side of it, you know, why do we suggest avoiding suspension? The goal is to support students in their education. Uh, and, and in reality, suspension leads to disengagement and lower academic performance. Overall, that, that can continue into post-secondary education. Building support is, is going to be very key here. So now, hopefully, we have everybody here on board and ready to, to move forward with our work here are some things that we need to keep in mind. Any change in policy is more successful when people impacted by it are engaged and part of the process. Get that buy-in and educate early. Include information about the policy change in newsletters and letters to parents and caregivers, as I know Nathan has highlighted as well, and review that policy periodically. We have already seen how the changes in the way people consume tobacco has changed, how we need to respond, and e-cigarettes will not be the last new thing in tobacco consumption, as Jeff has touched on as well. So, so how can the AHA support? And I know as we're coming on the last minute, I do want to leave some time here for some questions here. You know, I'm your resource here, especially here in our market, especially for our state. Uh, I can assist with those conversations, you know, share those personalized materials for your school district. We have education resources for the students, the staff, the parents, the list goes on there. And examples on signage and materials to communicate policy change are also available as well. And our in school districts that adopt that policy may be eligible for stipend to support those costs as well. So please do not hesitate to reach out to me uh, and we can definitely get that next, uh, further that conversation within your school district. So that being said, I know we're approaching time here. I know there's a lot of questions in the chat box, but I definitely want to use this time since we have this awesome panel to address questions from our audience at this point. And Jolene, I might need your help to, if there's a question that sticks out, help me out here. I'm about we'll to send you a list of questions. So give me just oh, a second. <laughs> and if we go over our time, I hope you guys can stay on for five extra minutes here. We definitely want to take care of some of these questions here. Let's see here. Um, Jolene, are you putting that in the chat box there for me? Wesley, I yep. could address one of the last questions that came up about discipline and how yes. and Nathan may be able to speak to that, how Linmar would handle that as well. I think typically for most of us, if a student self-reports to their counselor or anything like that, that they have a problem. There's usually not a discipline tied to that. And then we channel them through the, the different counseling resources that we have available to them. Um, obviously, if someone gets caught by school personnel or whatever, then they are channeled through the discipline side of it and then to counseling. Um, you know, but typically if a kid reports they have a problem or a parent might report to the counselor that they feel like their student has a problem, we'll handle that through our counseling office and not through discipline. Uh, I see there's one question here. Uh, let's see here. Is there any improvement in youth using e-cigarettes instead of traditional ones or is it simply a rebranding just as bad or worse for health? Uh, well, I, I know Dr. 
Dr. Kimball addressed, you know, a, a lot of the health risks that are associated with e-cigarette use uh, specifically. We know they're not safe. Uh, we know that they, uh, you know, they're harmful. Nicotine is bad for the uh, developing brain. And then, you know, the products themselves uh, bring along, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular risk, uh, uh, respiratory risk, uh, all kinds of risk. I think there's also the important uh, point that uh, the vast majority of young people who are using e-cigarettes would have never picked up a traditional cigarette. You know, we were getting to the point of 5% or less with youth cigarette smoking. Uh, and, you know, we were north of 20% uh, youth vaping at one point. So that difference, at, at minimum, that difference is the number of kids that were using e-cigarettes that would not have used traditional cigarettes. And then Dr. Kimball also mentioned that we see how there's a transition, you know, transition from e-cigarettes to cigarettes. And, you know, cigarettes, I think, are still, uh, you know, are still the, the, the most highly effective nicotine delivery device that, that's out there. So, uh, yeah, we, we see no uh, beneficial use of e-cigarettes among young people. And we see very questionable uh, use of these products as a cessation aid, as again, as Dr. Kimball outlined. I, I, would, I would just add to that, that we know there's, there's no benefit of nicotine. Nicotine is harmful to everyone, whether you are a young person with a growing body and a growing brain or as an adult. So we, we don't see a benefit in it. Definitely, um, you know, I have young children who can look at a cigarette, a traditional combustible, and they'll tell me, yuck, that's really gross. And, but they may be the ones that go into vaping. So they, they see them as two polar opposites almost, but they're interested in the e-cigarettes. I agree. Are there any other questions that jump out at you, Jolene? I am scrolling now. But if we, like I said, I don't want to hold you guys too long for the questions that are in the chat. We will definitely address those and would provide follow-ups to all of our guests and attendees as well. You know, was, there was one question that might be worth addressing that I saw earlier, and it was, you know, what do we do if young people uh, aren't interested in quitting? Uh, so first, uh, our, our surveys show that uh, half, at least half of all young people who are vaping want to quit. So we've got a very uh, receptive group of young people out there who want to quit. So bringing those cessation resources to them is critically important. But then, uh, you know, we heard today a lot about how schools are able to implement education programs, prevention curriculum, uh, you know, cessation offerings for young people. And all of those programs, you know, the strong programs are all designed to ensure that young people understand the risks that are associated and, and also, you know, to let them know that, that help is available, that they can quit. So I think if we implement this framework with prevention education and cessation support, we will see even more young people uh, interested in quitting and, and help them be successful. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Any other questions that jump out? All right. Well, that being said, I once again, I want to thank uh, our panel for your time today and addressing this growing concern. And I would like to thank our guests for, for taking time out of your busy day to listen to this important <clears throat> topic from a great panel of experts, uh, knowing that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done to address this. And, uh, we'll definitely be providing some follow-ups here soon and looking forward to working with our school districts throughout the state of Iowa. Once again, that is our time, and thank you very much for being here today.